afternoon. My name is Chris Morrow, and it's my pleasure today to introduce Senator Russ Feingold. Um, he is here celebrating the publication of his new book, While America Sleeps, A Wake-Up Call for the Post-9-11 Era. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, yeah. great. Russ Feingold is a man known for the courage of his convictions. This important book marks the return of his principled and uncompromising voice. His shockingly reasonable and carefully considered views, as well as his respect for and collaboration with such Republican colleagues as John McCain and John Ashcroft, will make progressives, Wisconsinites, and other frustrated Americans nostalgic for the days of a more thoughtful and productive Congress. A Janesville, Wisconsin native, Russ Feingold was elected to the United States Senate in 1992 and served for 18 years. He was the co-author of the well-known McCain-Feingold campaign finance reform bill, which banned soft money, a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for 18 years, and a member of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence for five years, among various other committees and duties. Senator Feingold is a graduate of the Uni University of Wisconsin-Madison, Oxford University, and Harvard Law School. He served as a member of the Wisconsin State Senate for 10 years before joining Congress. For the past year, he's been a visiting professor at Marquette University Law School and was a distinguished visioner, visitor at Stanford University this last semester. And in addition to all that, in the last year, Senator Feingold founded Progressives United, an organization devoted to challenging the dominance of corporate money over our democracy. So please join me in welcoming Senator Russ Feingold. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody there. Wow, this is a lot of people. Very, very nice. It's good to be at North Shore Bookstore and to be here uh, again in Vermont. I think it's my third visit, once when we were escaping law school for the weekend to see the incredible leaves up here. We have nice leaves, too, in Wisconsin, but they're more sort of spread out. You're the, the intensity here really struck me. And then I tried one day, all day, to keep up with Bernie, Bernie Sanders when he was campaigning for the Senate, and I was completely exhausted by the end of the day. Uh, and this, this time, what a, what a beautiful, wonderful state, and I had a chance to spend a few hours here already, and it's just a delight to be here. Not to mention the unbelievably progressive politics that you have in this state. In this we need more of that in this country, I'll tell you that given the opportunity after the election to, to write a book. Random House said, you want to write a book? And I said, okay. You know, I've never done anything of the kind. Uh, and it was something I always wanted to do. And then they said, but, but what do you want to write about? So I thought, what, a, what an opportunity. And you know, people would have assumed maybe I'd write about campaign finance reform, which I'd love to do someday, or uh, the sort of 1,296 town meetings I had in Wisconsin. I have tons of stories from that. But I decided I wanted to write about something that I wasn't really hearing from people and that I hope will start a conversation in this country. And that is that it seems to me that somehow we've lost our way uh, since 9-11, after I fought after 9-11, that we all got it, that we had to start thinking about and understanding the rest of the world. I thought that was the one thing that came through. Uh, you know, the notion that, that you cannot possibly either be successful or safe in this world if you don't understand the rest of the world. And it seems to me that we simply have, as I say in the title of the book, gone back to sleep with regard to that fundamental issue. And, you know, it's partly understandable. Naturally, we had the economic collapse in uh, September of 2008, and this economy has been difficult, and we have to deal with those problems, uh, and we have to be very concerned about domestic issues. But I don't know if you got a better cliche than this one. It's, it's just the fact that we have to learn how to walk and chew gum at the same time. You can't do, just, just do domestic issues. We can't just say, uh, well, we'll get to that foreign stuff later. Because that's, I think, partly why we were surprised on 
I think 9-11 showed us what it feels like to be taken completely by surprise. But a few years later, what we have here is not at least a unity of purpose with regard to facing our challenges overseas. What we have is a government and public at all levels divided against themselves and at war. We refuse to come together to solve problems. We have gridlock, partisanship, obsession with the next poll, let alone the next election, terrible corruption of big money in politics, frankly, like we've never seen before. It reminds me of Bob Dylan's words in his never uh, formally put on an album song, Blind Willie McTell, power and greed and corruptible seed seem to be all that there is. And yes, as I discuss in While America Sleeps, precious little is being said on our about our position in the rest of the world as of 2012, over 10 years after 9-11. Why did I pick the title? Uh, because I was reminded of the title of another book from a long time ago, Winston Churchill's While America Sleep, I mean, while, while England Slept. Now that doesn't mean I'm a Churchillian. That doesn't mean that I'm interested in arming America. But the analogy is, that Churchill, he actually didn't write a book. These are merely speeches he gave on the floor of the House of Commons, where he was trying to warn England, which had sort of been an island apart for a thousand years, that about the rearmament of the Germans, German uh, country. And so it was a, uh, an attempt to wake up a nation. And I think it is a decent analogy to what we are facing now and why I call it While America Sleeps. It isn't called While America Slept because I think we've gone back to bed on this issue. And we remember what it was like in, in 2001, of course. Uh, remember the summer of 2001? The biggest story was that, that there were a lot of shark attacks around the world. And I don't think it was that there were really more shark attacks. It was just really slow news summer. You know, sharks are pretty active uh, all the time. Uh, but there were enormous warnings uh, that had come and that we tended to disregard. We tend to disregard this stuff. 1998, uh, two American embassies attacked simultaneously in Africa. In 2000, USS Cole attacked in Aden, Aden Harbor with 17 American sailors, including one from Wisconsin, uh, being killed. Uh, the, the blowing up of those Buddhas, those huge, incredible Buddhas in, in Afghanistan was just chilling to me, but I don't think any of us could really put it together or recognize what could possibly be looming. And for me, the most uh, interesting one was a trip to Nigeria in early 2001. I, I chaired or was the ranking member of the Africa Subcommittee for 18 years, did a lot of my work in that area. Went up to Kano. We had no presence uh, as a country in Kano, Nigeria, but Kano is about the fifth or sixth largest Islamic city in the world. It's a very important place uh, in terms of history and in terms of the current Islamic world. And as we went down the street, we were not there for this purpose at all, we saw kids with not only Qaddafi t-shirts and postcards, but Osama bin Laden stuff. And I, you know, I didn't quite know what to think of it. We ran into it a few times, and I said to my staff member, I said, could you get me a briefing on what's going on with this when we get back? And you know, things do move slowly in Washington. She worked as hard as she could, but she finally got it scheduled, the briefing, for September 13th, 2011. So needless to say, it never happened. I think we got off to a decent start after 9-11. I thought George Bush's speech on the, in the Congress right after 9-11 was the best one I ever heard by a president. As you know, I was not a big Bush fan. I was probably his leading critic in the United States Senate. We got into Afghanistan in a reasonable way. I, have, I did vote for the Afghanistan uh, effort because we were trying to get these guys. We did it carefully with Colin Powell in the lead. But then, of course, everything went completely crazily off track with this Iraq invasion that made no sense and had no real justification. In fact, the chapter in the book is called The Iraq Deception. And if you get the book, you can see exactly the mental process that I went through and the discrepancy between what was being said by the administration and what we actually heard from CIA people in the private meeting. They did not track. So what happened after that? It became an after-the-fact attempt to justify Iraq and reordering the whole idea of what happened on 9-11 based on Iraq. The idea was, well, we, we're, we're in Iraq because Al-Qaeda, I guess, might come there? So invade a country and take it over, and of course, that's why they came there. And, and in fact, what I did in the book, a, a chapter called A Game of Risk, 
where I analogize our foreign policy approach in the last 10 years to the game of risk. And I'm always relieved when young people know what I'm talking about. You know, I, sell, I refer to the Shell Answer Man. If, remember the Shell Answer Man? They don't. Game of risk, they know. What's one of the rules in the game of risk? Once you invade a country, if you, you gotta keep your troops there. You can't, you can't take them ever completely away if you wanna keep that country. So that became our idea. You invade Afghanistan, you just stay there years and years and years after there's any justification for it at all. You go into Iraq by a mistake, and to justify the mistake, you stay there a ridiculously long amount of time without a real purpose. So this is sort of, instead of thinking of it as a global issue, whatever the issue is, it could be economic, it can be diplomatic, or it can be having to do with an organization like Al-Qaeda. I mean, even Bush went around saying there were like 55 countries where Al-Qaeda was operating, and, Al and uh, Iraq wasn't one of them. And yet he would rely on that figure. So for me, the idea here is that we have to stop having this myopia. We can only think of one country at a time, and our approach is to completely invade a country and essentially stay there forever, and I call that chapter, that, that concept, in for a penny, in for a pound. That you can't do something less than occupying a country. There are ways to deal with problems that, like this that are much less than that. I actually thought President Obama did a much better job in handling the Libya situation than was handled in other situations. He resisted the calls, especially from conservatives, to put boots on the ground. He used some force, working with the international community, to help Gaddafi out of his situation. It wasn't pretty, but it was far better than this notion that the United States of America has to simply invade countries in order to solve a problem. It's not only militarist, it doesn't make any sense in terms of an organization like Al-Qaeda. One illustration in terms of in looking at it as a different game, the game of Scrabble. Let's try that one. My mother was very good at Scrabble and would beat me consistently, but the best player I ever faced was a guy I subletted my apartment to in, at the University of Wisconsin around the time of Watergate. He was a 45-year-old uh, Taiwanese biochemist, brilliant guy, not great at English, but he challenged me to Scrabble, and he destroyed me. He got a seven-word score every time. And I finally said to him, his name was Ru Dong Wei, I said, Ru, how do you do that? He says, you must always think in two directions. And I've used that for everything, balling out staff members or, you know, <laughs> arguing with my kids or whatever for, for 40 years. Example here is thinking of Algeria. Algeria, of course, uh, fought for its freedom from the French in a brutal war, but in the early 90s, an Islamic party won an election, and the regime was so concerned that they canceled the next round of elections. A group of extremists uh, who exploited this, the Islamic religion, 3,000 of them known as the GSPC, created a horribly environment there, and the government responded just as violently. So why do I say this as an example of thinking in two directions? Because yes, they were Algerians, but they were 3,000 people that had spent several years in Afghanistan tr being trained by bin Laden and came back to Algeria to do that. And who are they now? Well, they've, they got hit pretty hard, but they've reconstituted themselves as Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. And where are they? They are in northern Mali, which has just been hit with a coup, and there is a, a problem with regard to the northern part of the country. So it's the, it's the ability to think about these things, uh, at, at, to think about more than one country at a time that I'm getting at. That's the first part of the book. The second part of the book, the second half, has to do with what I'd call the domestic exploitation of 9-11. The use of it for political purposes and for old agendas rather than the purpose that we all agreed on after 9-11. There were several examples. I don't need to tell people in Vermont about it. Bernie Sanders used to say that people said I was the only guy to vote against the USA, only senator to vote against the USA Patriot Act. He would say, if you elect me, I'll be the second senator that voted against the USA Patriot Act. Now, now of course, He's there, fortunately, <laughs> as a senator that voted against it. That was the first one. The passage of the USA Patriot Act, Bob Novak, not somebody I quote a lot, late Bob Novak, he said at the time it was an old wish list of the FBI, stuff they never could have gotten any other time, that they jammed in because they knew the bill had to pass 
including going after your library records, even if you uh, have not dined with al-Qaeda representatives here uh, in Vermont. That has never been fixed. The next thing was the uh, almost destruction of the balance of the Constitution by the Bush administration, by the assertion uh, through John Yoo memos that under the commander-in-chief powers, the president can simply disregard the law of the land, whether it be the laws of warrantless wiretapping or torture. Now, I am a supporter of President Obama for re-election. I'm a co-chair of his campaign. But it is... But it is essential that he uh, intensify his efforts to restore the balance of the Constitution. Why? It's one thing for an outlier like George Bush to make these assertions. But if a progressive president takes the same position with regard to commander-in-chief powers, it is embedded in our constitutional history. And I have high hopes that he will uh, do that in the future. Another uh, terrible consequence, particularly the last couple of years, not so much in the early years, at the time, George Bush and John Ashcroft made the right statements to not victimize Muslim Americans and Arab Americans. But the last couple of years have been a disaster. From the embarrassing chapter of saying that a mosque can't be built in southern Manhattan, the burning of Korans, to the awful hearings by Peter King, where he specifically tar targeted Islamic extremism in hearings. This is a very unfortunate development. I just spoke recently at the um, Advo uh, Muslim advocates, which is Muslim lawyers in the country, annual banquet. And I can hear them saying, we look forward to the time when we feel safe and welcome in our own country again. It is wrong and, and unwise to alienate some 7 to 10 million Americans. It's also kind of dumb to pick a fight with a billion people around the world uh, without any purpose when you're basically dealing with a, a beautiful and important religion. Finally, the exploitation is, is, has been recently the dumbing down of our foreign policy. And if you don't believe me, go back and watch the Republican debates again. I'm sure you'd like to do that. <laughs> they use very simple tactics. They don't want to talk about the rest of the world. They'll talk about Iran. They'll talk about one place at a time. But it's like saying that the president is always apologizing. You know, Romney's got a book just claiming that President Obama is always apologizing when, in fact, that isn't even true. Occasionally he says we might have done better here, which, you know, seems to me a simply mature thing to say once in a while, to admit you're not perfect. They mocked foreign trips. We didn't do that. When John Kennedy went to Berlin and said, Ich bin ein Berliner, we didn't mock that. In 1972, when I was an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin, I wanted to beat Richard Nixon more than anything in the world. But when he went to China, we praised him. And Ronald Reagan, and I was not a Ronald Reagan fan, needless to say, said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. We didn't mock him. We left that politics aside. President Obama has the wisdom to go to India, in an extremely important country at an extremely important time, and Fox News focuses on all the entourage he has, and they mock him and the First Lady for doing a traditional dance with people there, which was simply a sign of respect. This is, this is what passes for foreign policy debate. And then the ultimate is this notion of American exceptionalism. I think America is an exceptional country. I still think it's the greatest country in the world. I'm proud of that. But what good does it do to constantly say to people, we are it. We're the best. We're number one. It reminds me of my mother saying, don't brag in the on the schoolyard. Kids won't like it. <laughs> it. It doesn't make any sense. And yet, that is what we're at 10 years after 9-11, instead of looking to reach out more positively. And Butch, by the way, one of the reasons they don't want to talk about this is that President Obama has done a good job of reaching out to the rest of the world. Our reputation is far better than it was under George Bush, from Indonesia to uh, the Middle East to Europe. And that is enormously important for us. So this is how it's been exploited domestically. And I want to conclude in a minute because I want to answer questions primarily. But, you know, I'm not trying to use a scare tactic here. I'm just making an observation that the administration has basically said, you know, Osama bin Laden's dead, and even the Republicans are saying, you know, Al-Qaeda's done. Well, you know, that's not really true. We can kid ourselves that that's true. But they're active in Somalia. They're active in Yemen. They're active in, Al in northern uh, uh, Africa with Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. And in Nigeria... There's a group called Boko Haram, which means no more Western education. 
They've pulled off 70 to 80 bombings of religious sites, UN facilities, and are now planning attacks in Abuja uh, throughout the region. And all I can say is, of course we, we don't want this to be related to Al-Qaeda, but I feel like we've seen the movie before. My goal here is not that we go in there and <laughs> invade. My goal is that we at least know about it in advance. Who knows about it? Who's talking about it? Not our leaders. And so I think as progressives who want the American people to know that we care about our national security as anyone else, there is a progressive way to be aware of and knowledgeable about other countries and to know about places like Kano, Nigeria, which is where this organization is headed or founded. When I was teaching law at Marquette Law School, uh, I saw an article by a young man in the Marquette Tribune when the Arab Spring occurred. And it said in its title, Where in the World is Tunisia? And he said, Why is it that I'm a pretty good student and I've worked pretty hard and I've never heard of this country and now all of a sudden it's so important? He said, why do we know more about Kardashian than we do about Kyrgyzstan? <laughs> I thought it was a great little comment. I mean, and it's true of all of us, every one of us, including me, whether it's foreign languages or taking the opportunity to go overseas and help other people and having a presence, we don't have it right now. You know, there was, as I said, a book by Winston Churchill called uh, While England Slept. Well, in 1940, there was a, a Harvard uh, undergraduate who did his thesis there as a senior and uh, he had a pretty well-connected dad, so he was able to get it published as Why England Slept. And this is what uh, young John Fitzgerald Kennedy had to say. To say that democracy has been awakened by the events of the last few weeks is not enough. Any person will awaken when the house is burning down. What we need is an armed guard that will wake up when the fire starts, or better yet, one that will not permit a fire to start at all. Thanks for having me here. <laughs> Happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming. I've always been a huge fan of yours. And uh, I have so many questions, I don't know where to begin. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> that we're going to have to fight an army? Because it, it, it's always struck me that terrorism is like squeezing mercury. You, you just you can't do it. You know, you squeeze it here and it pops out. So you're not suggesting... No, it's, ju it's just the opposite. If we do it that way, you'll create... Sorry. He's asking me if, as I talk about continuing threats, if I'm saying we should have to fight an army. It's just the opposite. If we do it that way, if we do it the conventional way that we've done, done with Iraq and Afghanistan, if we don't do it simply working with local countries and officials who, you know, people in those countries don't want al-Qaeda there either. It's a cooperative thing. It's knowing the threat. It's trying to stop it in advance, trying to address many times the problems of people in those areas, you know, as we deal with this Joseph Coney thing now. You know, it's not just hunting down Joseph Coney. It's dealing with the fact that the people in northern Uganda have been devastated and you need to deal with the economic and social issues that are connected with an area like that if you don't want to feed into the potential of terrorism. So it's just the opposite. A good example is, is the way that was done with regard to Southeast Asia. You know, Jamai Islamaya, a group called JI, was active there. You know, they bombed the people in Bali and, and Jakarta. We didn't use an invade a country at a time approach. There was cooperation between the Philippines, uh, Indonesia, and Malaysia uh, to try to identify these folks. And instead of it being some huge military thing, it was a targeted thing where we didn't enrage the populations. And this, of course, has to do with the drone issue. If the drones are overused in a way that you know, devastates people in an area, it creates a counter reaction, which, of course, is happening in both Pakistan and Yemen is that the level of, of anger uh, that is connected with the overuse of this, so this is not, you know, here's how I look at it. There's this tendency in, in, on, in our country, especially in Washington, to look at this, these issues as a manhunt. You know, it's like a manhunt all the time. It really is a much more subtle thing that has to do with diplomacy, with intelligence, with reaching out positively, and sometimes militarily. But yes, I'm suggesting the approach is being knowledgeable and 
trying to avoid that situation instead of using it as a first resort, which is what we tend to do. Well, I agree with the president that Assad, oh, what do I see with Assad and Syria? Um, I agree with the president that Assad has to go. It's an unacceptable situation. It's going to be harder than Libya, but probably less difficult in figuring out how to uh, dislodge the situation in Iran. There are advantages in this situation. One of them is that the Arab League has taken a, an unprecedented stand against not just one of its members, but one of its most fundamental founding members, the country of Syria and, and, the, and the Assad family. That is an enormous advantage. And recently, when the Assad government did not immediately agree with the ceasefire, that they had followed through on the ceasefire, finally, Russia and China came around in a little way at the UN. So it's the combination of those two things, and, and we may need to assist the, 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 the people fighting back in some ways, but certainly, again, not an example of where we should talk about boots on the ground. And it might take a little longer, but we have got to remove him from power, hopefully without uh, an, an extremely aggressive situation. But I think those power points and pressure points will work. We cannot abandon the Syrian people. I don't want to get too technical and law professory on you here, uh, but this is something that, that we were very careful about on McCain-Feingold. The most important vote on McCain-Feingold was making sure that we passed what was called a severability provision, which you'll hear a lot about in a few weeks, which means as if one part of the bill is struck down, the rest can survive. So we had, he had a tough vote. Mitch McConnell knew very well that he wanted it all wrapped up in one bow, uh, under one bow so it could all come down. And he failed, and therefore, when small pieces of McCain-Feingold were struck down, and most of it's still alive, the rest of it survived. A, a mistake was made. The bill passed with a severability provision in the Senate. When it came back from the House, uh, they failed to keep that provision in there. So the court has some flexibility in this regard. Uh, I don't think it's a valid argument that it's unconstitutional. The trouble is I'm not exactly the same guy as some of the justices. Uh, I still don't think they'll do it, but the inside court observers think that they may strike it down. And then the question will be, do they just strike down the individual mandate, which of course is very important to the whole way that it works. It's not a trivial provision. Or you know, do they take that key piece out of it and let the whole rest of it stay? And you know, I hope they, if they do that, I hope they at least do that, because you know, Bernie put in there $10 billion for community health centers, which is one of the best things in the whole bill. They said that was Bernie's blackmail. I'd like to see more of that kind of thing. That's not exactly, you know, pork for just your own state. I mean, it was the most, you know, we're going to have health care for everybody. It would be kind of nice if they have a place to go for the health care. So anyway, yeah, I would say it was not carefully done. Uh, uh, it, uh, the, and it should have been. Some people believe that oil is a major component of uh, the foreign policy of the U.S. Can you comment on that notion? Some people say that oil is a major component of our foreign policy would I, and our military policy, would I comment on it? I don't think there's any question that it is. I don't think it's the only reason that some of this stuff was done, uh, the neocon stuff. There are other uh, notions about geopolitical power and other motives uh, that are troubling, but I think the oil thing obviously has driven much of this. Uh, getting away from oil dependence and at least uh, having less dependence on oil in that region would be a wise thing. Uh, but yeah, it is troubling the extent to which oil clearly, when, when some of these insiders are candid, they do admit that that's a huge part of the consideration. Oh, sorry, OK. Superb.
I, and we, you know, we, we had a tussle or two in the Senate, uh, Hillary, you know, she's, she's pretty tough. And, uh, she wasn't, uh, you know, always enamored of my approach to campaign finance reform. So I was kind of waiting to see how, she, how she'd do. I, I, and, and as I tell in the book, we were in Pakistan, and which is an amazing commentary on this stuff. We only went to Pakistan with McCain and a couple, and Susan Collins and Lindsey Graham in 2005, just so we could get to, from Iraq to, if, uh, get from Iraq to Afghanistan, because you can't fly over Iran. That's the only reason we went to Pakistan. It was like a stopover. A couple years later, oh, everything's Pakistan, and we were thinking about, you know, there were the first little hints that that maybe bin Laden had gone over the border to Waziristan, he was actually a short cab right away. And Hillary was with us. And we had a chance to kind of spend a few minutes, you know, one of these little stores, and I just talked to her on the side. And the way she talked about Pakistan, her knowledge of the history and the key players in Pakistan, I thought to myself, she's ready to be president. And needless to say, ready to be not just a good Secretary of State, but frankly a brilliant one who I think has been amazing and I, I just, my guess is that she's going to take a break from that and I think she might be running for another office uh, at some point. I wouldn't be surprised. She's done great. Oh, you're from Kenosha. It's where my sister lives. Yeah. Worked on the, um, our whole family worked on Mike Lasko. You know. So did I. My first campaign. When I was yeah. 17 years old from Janesville. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. Um, anyway, my question is, having lived in different places, it boggles the mind that so many voters, so many Americans vote against their own Yes. <laughs> Why, your question is, why, why is it that so many people vote against what appears to be their own interests? Uh, you know, I, <laughs> I wrote a piece in uh, one of the blog sites uh, after the 2004 election wondering why people in Greenville, Alabama, where I was going through at the time, would vote for, for Bush. I mean, this was a town in tough shape. And yet they voted for him. They voted for Democrats at the local level. You know, there are a number of, of factors here. You know, one of them is this thing that my book's about when it comes to international policy. We, and I include myself, don't know enough about the rest of the world to evaluate it. I mean, how many of us were really clear about the Sunni and Shia distinction? How many of us knew that Persians weren't Arabs? You know, we don't even know the basics of, of, of these great civilizations over time and how these strands fit together to be able to not lump everything into one category. That's one reason. Another reason is we're optimistic people. So when it's obvious that there's global warming and your state is devastated and that Al Gore was right to raise this issue, a couple people start saying, you know, actually that's junk science. We Americans go, oh good. We don't have to worry about it anymore. Let's be ridiculous and pretend it's not happening and go on to the next thing. That is what has happened. I'll tell you, I tell the story in this book about some encounters I had in a place in Wisconsin that is a whole lot like Vermont in terms of people and their views. And having somebody say at a town meeting in 2009 that this was a joke and having the whole crowd cheer. I was flabbergasted. It's just a desire to, to believe that everything's going to be OK. It's sort of my nature. But we used to, as a people, understand that that also included making important decisions and having a plan. And, and 
that seems to be missing. It's, it's uh, very troubling. Somebody over here? Yes. Well, I blame that on the other 49 states, not Wisconsin. No, oh, sorry. Why is it that liberal became, is no longer the word and it's progressive? And I say I blame the other 49 states. It was always progressive in Wisconsin. <laughs> I am a son of a progressive. Fighting Bob La Follette was one of the greatest progressives in American history. And that has always been the movement. Of course, in Minnesota, it's the DFL, Democratic Farm Labor Party. So it was not liberal. It was always to us running as a progressive. In fact, it was its own political party in Wisconsin. After the Civil War, the Democrats didn't win until 1932 in the uh, Roosevelt landslide. So a separate progressive party developed out of the Republican Party and became a force for many of the greatest reforms in this nation. The first state to do child labor laws, the first state to do unemployment, the state that invented Social Security. This all came out of the progressive movement. So for me, the word progressive conveys who I am, but I don't think people should be you know, embarrassed or shy about being able to owning up to having liberal views, they've intimidated people on that. I didn't do it. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I blame Wellstone a little bit for it. Actually, I think, but in a good way, because Paul, Paul did a wonderful job. I mean, clearly the, you know, the advisors and stuff were saying to people, the L word is bad. And I, I never did that consciously for the reason I just said. But I think a lot of Democrats across the country realize the word progressive um, sort of suggested a sense of community and a sense of positive change moving forward. Yeah. How do you distinguish progressive from Well, there are two progressive traditions that, that, that cause some of this. How do you distinguish between progressivism from socialism? The Wisconsin progressivism really was not particularly related to socialism, although it had pieces of it. Because in Milwaukee, uh, the best governing that was ever done there was done under socialist mayors, which was typically true, that many people elected socialists in different places in the world because of their effectiveness at governing. I understand you had one here in the state who was a mayor, who is now a United States uh, senator. But it was more a good government, clean government movement, getting big money out of politics, fighting the monopolies. That was the spirit of Wisconsin progressive. But the word progressivism writ large, when you're talking about a political history, European socialism, that word is also used to talk about progressivism in that context. So when you really look at, at the word as it's used in our country, it's kind of a blend of the two. Depends whether you're talking about prairie populism, or progressivism of the kind that I came out of, or the more international form. Way in the back. All right, that's my other topic. What, uh, what is the best strategy to overturn Citizens United? Let me first say that I'm glad people are advocating for a constitutional amendment, even though I have qualms about it. The reason I have qualms about it are two. I was chairman of the Constitution Subcommittee in the Senate. You wouldn't believe the ideas I had to kill about what they wanted to do with the Constitution and how they wanted to amend the Bill of Rights for the first time. We have never amended the Bill of Rights. We have never amended the First Amendment. So I have qualms about it, despite the ridiculousness of this decision. The second thing is it's exceedingly unlikely to happen. I don't want to, I'm not trying to pour cold water on it because it's really helping the overall cause. And if there becomes evidence that it can really happen, I'll pull back on that argument. The best way to do it is to overturn the decision. And people say, well, how do you do that? You know, I've actually had people say to me throughout the country, we understand the only way to deal with Citizens United is to overturn the decision. That's just not, or is to pass a constitutional amendment. That's just not true. It was a mistake. And we get President Obama reelected. I'm hoping he has a couple of choices on the Supreme Court. And I'm hoping one of those choices involves one of the five people that were involved in this awful decision. There's no guarantee. Maybe we have to elect Hillary for eight years uh, after that. 
But the point is, is it involves winning presidential elections, and if you have any qualms about voting for the president, which it's possible a couple of progressives in the country sometimes feel that way, all you need is the two words, Supreme Court. Yeah. Now, there is a second phenomenon that is occurring right now that I wouldn't have said two months ago. I, I was out at uh, Stanford teaching uh, first part of the year, and things started to develop. In, with a case out of Montana, where Montana is saying, you know what, we had this law about corporate expenditures for 100 years. Who was the Supreme Court to say that this was some kind of an invalid law all of a sudden? So they've challenged it. And they're going to decide whether to take up the Montana case, which would, if it went with Montana, overturn Citizens United. And the court hasn't changed. But Justice Ginsburg, when they took the initial argument on it, wrote a short piece that said it is getting more and more difficult for the court to not take notice, judicial notice, of the, of the fact that, of course, there's a corruption connection between super PACs and what's going on. Really unusual for a justice to do that before a case is right. I believe, and I have reason to know this, that there is turmoil on the court and concern that they've maybe, maybe really gone way too far. And you know, there are people like Justice Kennedy who wrote the opinion, a very unfortunate opinion, and even Chief Justice Roberts, who I was appalled by his role in this and his opinion is, is an embarrassing excuse for claiming this was somehow justified under the, under the current law, which it wasn't. It's not justifiable, but I predict that the court's going to pull back from this thing to a degree and gradually because it's creating a meltdown in our country. I also think the court knows something else. You put Bush v. Gore and Citizens United as bookends of 10 years, and if they knock down that health care bill, that institution's credibility is in the sink. It's destroyed. And it will, it will be seen. It's already seen as incredibly partisan in a way that I don't think mo most of us felt. They have an institutional problem that's getting worse by the day. I have much more to say about this. <laughs> And there are, uh, he's saying there, it's hard to, to deal with some of these things because of the contradictions and the complexities even coming out of the Obama administration. Yeah, the, the, the assassination of Al-Awlaki is, is a great example of how complicated this is. I, for one, am glad he's gone. I think he was part and parcel of what was going on with Al-Qaeda. But you can't just say, oh, it, you can just disregard the notion that he was an American citizen uh, because of his connection. There's only one justification for having done that, and that would be if it was clear that there was no other way to get him. Okay? How do we determine if that's true? Well, this White House has refused to even uh, issue a public legal opinion from the Office of Legal Counsel to tell us what the legal justifications were. We don't even get that, let alone enough facts to know whether this was true. And then, unfortunately, Attorney General Holder gave a speech in Chicago, and he said, you know, we believe in due process, but we don't think you have to have judicial due process. You can have executive due process. In other words, they make up a little list of who they think they can kill and nobody ever gets to see it, including American citizens. So I didn't come out against the fact that he had been taken out, but I am extremely concerned about this doctrine that they can just make this stuff up without accountability. And this needs to be litigated. Fortunately, the ACLU has brought litigation and the there has to be clear standards for this, and of course, it still has to be an exceptionally rare uh, situation where an American citizen could be subjected to that because they are entitled to due process. Yes? I commend you for voting according to the way you feel your voting place and happens. And you probably, in the Guinness Book of World Records, would be the only senator who votes the only one in two issues on national. But how can America? can't even pass anything in the last four years or eight years in our 
own constitution or any measure that comes up in Congress because it's so bipartisan and nobody goes to court to answer. Yeah. And indeed, reports in the, about the stock market that there's declines in the market because America can't solve its own monetary issues because nobody votes against it across lines. You heard Daddy, you know, he's saying, that, you know, how can we talk about the rest of the world, and as he said, please the rest of the world, when we can't resolve problems in this country at all. We're, we're at gridlock. If you, if you didn't see the New York Times today, I recommend Tom Friedman's column today. It, it's about exactly this. That, and if, he even quotes me in there, which was nice. Uh, <laughs> but but he's, he's sort of talking about that how is it that we can't do things anymore. And, you know, that's not the way it was even a few years ago. Right up until the time of the Tea Party, which is two, three years ago, that's not the way it was. Now, what was done on a bipartisan basis was often not pretty, such as rotten trade agreements to ship our jobs overseas, such as passing the Telecommunications Act, which was a big gift to huge corporations, such as repealing the Glass-Steagall Act, which led to the destruction of, uh, and I don't need to tell you how I voted on these things. Uh, I was one of 10 or 11 to vote no on every one of them. And that, that's the sign, though, but that's your clue. If it's that kind of vote, that means both parties have been bought out. Having said that, there were other experiences, such as working with John McCain in campaign finance reform, such as working with uh, people like Susan Collins on health care issues, uh, such as you know, attempts to uh, come together even on uh, fixing the Patriot Act. That was a bipartisan group of three Republicans and three Democrats over several years. Now they will punish, particularly Republicans, if they do anything on a bipartisan basis. I remember I was at one of these tough town meetings where my supporters were, I don't know where they were, but the, <laughs> but the Tea Party was there, and they said, how come you never work with the Republicans? And I said, well, I work with Lindsey Graham. And, and I said, and Lindsey Graham is working with John Kerry on global uh, change, global warming. And they said, oh, he's a rhino, which means a Republican in name only. And sure enough, they passed uh, resolutions in county parties in South Carolina condemning him, censuring him for working with the other party. So this is devastating to our system of government and to our security. If we can't solve problems, clearly it affects us both domestically and internationally. Hostilities. Yeah, hostilities. No, you're right. Yeah. Uh, that well, but what did the war uh, did the Obama administration's uh, approach to Libya with regard to deal, working with Congress uh, destroy the War Powers Act? Well, the War Powers Act is already not accepted by the executive branch, except for in certain situations. However, executives have generally at least acknowledged the, the need to report uh, back, even though they don't accept other parts. You are absolutely right. Why would the Obama administration disregard their own Office of Legal Counsel's opinion that it was a hostility? The White House lawyers overruled their own Justice Department. I mean, at least Bush followed the ridiculous memos of John Yoo. You know, which actually was unfortunate. But this was an honest legal opinion. So I agree with the way he handled the overall issue, but the lack of consultation with Congress and the disregard of the War Powers Act on the most fundamental points is a I think a very bad thing and, and should be reversed. Are you considering trying to reclaim your seat, your Senate seat? Um, am I trying to uh, considering trying to reclaim my Senate seat? Uh, the other senator uh, chose not. Herb Cole is not running for re-election, and, and Tammy Baldwin will be a great United States senator from Wisconsin by the end of this year, replacing that Senate seat. I haven't uh, thought seriously yet about whether a race in 2016 would make sense, but you know, I certainly wouldn't rule it out. It's, it's, uh, you know, I have to think about it. And I, I want to just amplify it by saying it is a, a good thing after 28 years in public life and, and always looking at things from that perspective to look at the world from another perspective. I've taught, I've spent time with young people, I've had a chance to write a book, I've had a grandson, and my daughter's getting married, you know. I think we do better with people in public life who have other things in their life. And the way the job is set up right now, particularly if you live in farther away in the country, is 
it really makes it hard for people to have the kind of life you, you want people to have. And, and, you know, frankly, having a chance to read something other than a memo from a staff member. So anyway, I'm having a great time, and that's going to be the biggest problem in terms of going forward is I, I understand there are things that need to be done, and I'll be working hard, but I'm not planning to run for office at this point. Uh, yes? I was hoping that when Obama came into office, that might be the end of the neocons, but apparently it wasn't because they brought us the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war. And now they're trying to provoke us if we're attacking Iran. And 16 intelligence agencies said it's, it's these wrong moves, and three agencies in Israel said it's these wrong moves. But yet uh, they seem to do this without the approval of Congress, and no one ever gets prosecuted. Why? Well, I, I certainly, the question is whether the, the he thought the uh, advent of the Obama administration meant that we wouldn't have uh, the neocon policies. And he's concerned that they're continuing. I certainly don't think there's a neocon flavor in the White House. I do not feel that way. I, I think President Obama. No, not within the White House, but. Okay, so he, was, he is certainly not putting that out. I understand it when he says every option has to be on the table, but I believe this president really was effective in saying, let's stop the rush to war. He does not want to do this. He knows better than to do this unless it was some circumstance that I can't imagine. And I assume he's sending the same message to the Israelis, uh, that this, the case would have to be ironclad. And to, to favor the side of doing something that is so difficult, may not succeed when there are other ways to influence Iran. This is what's great about President Obama. And one of the reasons I'm supporting him so strongly is that he has not only been successful in foreign policy to the point where the Republicans don't want to talk about it. I think in his second term he could become one of our greatest presidents in terms of, of our international position. And, and that's because he either understands the nuances of situations or makes sure he does. And with Iran, we all know, it's not like Saddam Hussein's Iraq. It's not some kind of a megalomaniac that's just controlling everything. It's complicated. Aminijad is not all-powerful. The Ayatollah is not all-powerful. There are strands of culture and economy in that country that are very powerful and that can be influenced in a peaceful way, not so much by us, but by other allies. Talk about in the book the role that Indonesia plays vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Indonesia wants a good relationship with us, but they have a long relationship with Iran. You have to use those kinds of levers to convince Iran to not go the route of a nuclear weapon. And I think ultimately it will succeed because of pressure from within Iran and also from some of their allies. Well, obviously, there should be a credible international regime in this regard. Oh, sorry. Who should make the decision about um, what countries should have nuclear weapons and, and, and who should not? Well, I can't even I can make a decision to get rid of them. I would hope we could get back to that. I can't tell you the decline. Can, can we make a decision to get rid of them? I can't tell you the decline in members of Congress that were willing to talk about that in the years that I was there. When I came there, it was one of you know, 40 senators or 50 that would talk about it. Then it got down to 25. I was the only one out there trying to stop him from, from undoing one of the nuclear treaties, and it was just done without the permission of the Senate. Now, I was like this outlier guy trying to point out that, you know, if we can approve a treaty, we should also have to be consulted to disapprove a treaty. And the Senate just said, don't worry about it, because this issue has lost so much of its clout. Uh, you know, I voted against the deal with India, because India is not within the regime. And yet there were 85 senators, because of the power of India and its influence in the world, that voted to allow uh, India to go forward with this agreement with us. So yeah, it has been diminished to the point where it is a very weak issue. And when I first ran for office, along with environmental issues and women's issues, that would have been the third of the triumvirate on the progressive side, the, the anti-nuclear campaigns that need to be revived. And you know, it's interesting. I, uh, when I, again, when I had the opportunity to be out at Stanford, there were a number of somewhat conservative former administration officials and others who actually approached me about a plan they have to get back to a plan to go in that direction. So, yes. Yes, straight ahead. Hi, um, I'm 
Two more after that? Okay. Did people get the gist of that? Yeah, having to do with uh, you know these uh, these factory farms and so on, and people being prevented from exposing what's going on. My daughter works for the Humane Society in Washington and talks to me about this a lot. I think this is terrible that these can't things can't be exposed. I mean, here I am in the second greatest dairy state in the nation. Yeah. <laughs> And, and we share, I'm sure, a common feeling, because I fought these battles in community after community. Sometimes it was chicken factories, sometimes it was beef factories, sometimes it was hog farms, sometimes it was dairy farms. This is a, a, an awful trend in economically, but also in terms of some of the hum inhumane practices. So I, I share your concern on that. I'll take two more. Is there one down here? Yeah. Well, Wellstone was over in Minnesota, but <laughs> how did our state like ours go from Proxmire to, okay, remember, our state went from Joe McCarthy to Proxmire, <laughs> okay? A little schizophrenia. Uh, we, uh, what's that? Well, so, some of these tactics are, you know, one of the hardest things for me was always being introduced as the junior senator from Wisconsin. That used to be the dirtiest word in American politics, as was Joe McCarthy. Anyway, uh, we have different tendencies in our state. You know, people got awful comfortable. They go, oh, Wisconsin's a blue state now. Wisconsin's a state that goes back and forth. It's complicated uh, with the different pockets and the way in which people approach things. The thing that's really changed very bad, in a very bad way, is we had a huge independent bloc. And it appears that people become very polarized now, that the independent bloc seems smaller. And what Scott Walker's done in Wisconsin is, is unforgivable. Not just on the merits, but the tactics were, were absolutely outside of the character of our state that has been genteel and bipartisan in its politics over the years at the state level. Yes, we had McCarthy, but we have not had this kind of thing at the state level. So we are planning to remove him from office on June 5th. <laughs> You're the last one. That's a great question to finish on. What can we do to stop this gridlock and this partisanship and this inability to solve problems? Some of it, you know, I think people think sometimes it can be done simply by making changes in the procedures in, in Washington. That can help. I don't think we should completely eliminate the filibuster. You saw your Senator uh, Bernie Sanders do a nice one last year, and, and, and it has its place. But, you know, we've made it awful easy for these guys. They can just file, a, uh, they can just say they're going to filibuster, and all 60 senators that have to be there in person to vote to get rid of the filibuster, the other 40 can be in the Bahamas. So, and of course, that's, they take off. So it's, a, it's nothing like what the founders intended. 
Making it 60% of those present would change it completely. And, you know, senators like their weekend. So it would make it kind of hard. But you know what? That's only, none of that's going to work unless we fundamentally as a people demand a different government. One of the stories I, I like to tell is that I'd go to every one of Wisconsin's 72 counties every year and hold a town meeting. We did it every year for 18 years. And I wouldn't set the topic. I would go to the, every county, large or small, and I'd start, and I'd say, hey, everybody, everybody gets a chance to talk for two, three minutes, just fill out a slip, and we'll go through it. But I'd always say a word or two at the beginning about like one thing I was working on. And one time I, I came back and I said, I am uh, working on a bill with Senator John McCain. And everybody started cheering wildly. And I said, well, wait a minute, you know, it could be a bill to eliminate the dairy industry in Wisconsin or something. Yeah, they laughed. But the point is, and then I told them it was whatever it was, revolving door bill or gift ban or campaign finance. The point is, they craved bipartisanship. They believed that the deal was is they put up with these awful campaigns, so afterward we would try to solve problems and work together. You must demand that of your elected officials. You must say to your elected officials, if you can't prove to me that you have worked with other people and been effective with other people in both parties, I'm not voting for you anymore. That has to be part of the deal. You can be a progressive. I hope I demonstrated this. You can be a progressive and also find opportunities to work with people on the other side. But if you don't demand it, what politicians do is follow, as you know. They should lead, but they follow. They are following the threats at the extremes they are not following the goodness of the American people who want us to work together. Thanks so much for having me here.